is actually moving in across the south. But these weather fronts have been providing a mixture of rain, sleet and snow across parts of Scotland. And uh, making for some treacherous conditions first thing this morning over parts of Scotland through the central belt. Snow falling for a time before turning back to rain as we go through the day. But we could see a fair few centimetres in some locations, certainly up over the mountains of western Scotland, several centimetres expected. Much of Northern Ireland dry, but some rain showers across the north. Most of England and Wales dry. Some fog around this morning as well. That will take a while to clear, but then plenty of sunshine. But temperatures yet again struggling to get much above one or two degrees Celsius. That wintry weather continues across parts of Scotland. More and more turning to rain uh, at low levels, certainly, but more snow over the higher routes here. And everything could freeze up through this evening, so it may well turn icy. And we'll see a few more showers just drifting into southern Scotland, then northern England overnight. So again, it could be icy. It's going to be a cold evening if you're heading out tonight. Temperatures by morning again well below freezing across England and Wales. A little milder further north where we'll have more cloud. But still some showers coming in. And we'll have those outbreaks of rain, sleet and snow over northern England and north Wales during Saturday. Again, most of the snow on the hills, but some is possible at lower levels. Mostly rain, though, at lower levels. Snow coming in across the highlands of Scotland throughout Saturday. But much of eastern Scotland and much of the Midlands, south Wales, southern England, dry and fine during tomorrow. Temperatures a little higher, four, five, maybe seven or eight across the southwest and milder areas on the way for Sunday. This area of low pressure is moving in. It's going to lift the temperatures, but it is also going to bring some wet weather and we could see a spell of heavy snow. See the Met Office website for the warnings. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. So I'm please. completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me, Nana Akwe, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. 
We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Strike chaos continues, but where does the country sit and might it be resolved at all? We'll explore the questions of strikes today and look at a new report on intergenerational inequality. The Adam Smith Institute have got some interesting things to say on that. Plus, the Prime Minister is in Northern Ireland today. What on earth could that signify? We'll explore it all after the headlines. Good morning, it's 9.31. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Four people are in a critical condition after a suspected crowd crush at a music venue in South London. Police were called to the Brixton O2 Academy last night following reports a large number of people were trying to force entry. The suspected crush happened during a concert by a Nigerian Afrobeat singer. The Met Police say eight people were taken to hospital. Labour's Andrew Weston has become the country's newest MP, winning the Stretford and Urmston by-election. The Trafford Council leader secured 69% of the votes, but with only a 25% turnout in South Manchester. Mr Weston claims the victory shows the British people are giving up on the Tories. Rishi Sunak has met the leaders of Stormont's five main political parties as part of his first visit to Northern Ireland as Prime Minister. Mr Sunak's in Belfast to focus on restoring power sharing at Stormont. He'll also use the two-day visit to promote the government's investment in shipbuilding in the city. And British retailers recorded a drop in sales last month despite online discounts and Christmas shopping. The Office for National Statistics says the volume of sales went down by 0.4% last month. It follows a rise of 0.9% in October. The ONS says department stores did report increased sales with a longer period of Black Friday offers helping. Retail expert Kate Hardcastle says the cost of living crisis is forcing consumers to change their shopping habits. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to the briefing with Tom. Good morning, happy Christmas. It's 9.33 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now, first this morning, as strikes are once again crippling the nation, we've asked in our GB News People's Poll what the country as a whole makes of them. Well, of course, yet more rail strikes hit today, with the RMT union members walking out until the end of Saturday. We asked whether the British people support ongoing industrial action. And just under half, 44%, said yes, while 29% opposed the strikes outright. 14% say they neither support nor oppose. But interestingly, 77% of Labour voters support the strikes while only 20% of Conservative voters do. Perhaps here is the crucial question, however. When asked who they, who, 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 uh, they blame for the strikes, 37% of Brits blame the government, while only 28% blame the, blame the trade unions. Well, joining us now for an update on the rail strikes is our reporter Jack Carson, who's in Birmingham. Uh, Jack, uh, how's it looking now? 
Well, Tom, it's looking very quiet for a start. Of course, Network Rail and other rail companies warning passengers to stay away. And that, to be honest, has been uh, that message has been well and received here in Birmingham, certainly. Still a few people going into the station, but there is lots of shops and stuff on the upper floors. But in terms of rail services here, there is mass disruption here at New Street. There are still some services, uh, very small local services running between 7, uh, 7 this morning and 7 tonight. But in terms of like the, the longer distance journeys, journeys into like to London that many people use for business, and commutes, they're all cancelled today and they will be cancelled uh, on the on the coming strike action in the coming weeks. Now, of course, the RMT um, began another 48-hour 48 strike, to, 48 hour strike today. Uh, they failed to make progress yesterday. Um, RMT said they're in further discussions but had agreed that in the meantime, all industrial action uh, remains in place. Of course, yesterday we did hear, hear that the TSSA uh, members at Network Rail voted to accept a pay offer, but members at Avanti West Coast, which of course is, is one of the main lines here, will, will continue their strike action today. Mm. Really interesting stuff there. Perhaps some divisions starting to appear. TSSA supporting the pay offer, whereas the RMT is not. So we'll keep an eye on those developments. But for now, Jack, thank you so much for joining us here on The Briefing. But what's behind these strikes? As we saw in the poll at the start of the show, the PR operation of these unions is clearly working well. But what is the motive from those at the top with organisations agitating for stri strike action? Well, the historian Giles Udi has been looking into this question and he's found that the figures in the leadership of the RMT have held positions within some pretty extremist groups. The Communist Party of Great Britain, indeed. And indeed, they've been linked to militant tendency. Many have declared themselves proud Marxists and even posted internet memes venerating Joseph Stalin. Now, this was far better known about back in the 1970s and 1980s. In 1979, 51% of the public said that the trade unions were run by communists with 8%, only 8%, rejecting that claim outright. And in 1984, the time of the miners' strike, 33% backed the miners at most, with many more on the side of the employer. That's, of course, in stark contrast to where the public sits today, with at least uh, up to now, more people siding with the union leaders than with the employers. But. Uh, we should know more about those people behind these strikes. And I'm delighted to be joined by Giles Udi, the author and Soviet historian who specialises on the influence of communism and Marxism in British politics. And um, uh, Giles, is it a conspiracy to say that these people are all sort of conspiring to, to, to reach ends that aren't just about pay and conditions? Well, they obviously have the basic public motive, which is supporting their workers in the current dispute about pay and conditions. Um, if that was all that they were doing or all that their record showed they believed they wanted, then I think it would be a different matter. But uh, people have forgotten, as you so rightly say, uh, some of the past history of the British left. And if you look at the collective leadership of the RMT, they are substantially and overwhelmingly extreme Marxists. The evidence is there quite clearly. Their president, uh, Alex Gordon, uh, is on the executive of the Communist Party of Britain. He's, uh, he's tweeted Happy Birthday Lenin. He's given speeches alongside Marx's tomb. He has said, and these are the crucial bits, he said that he wants to replace our current market economy with a socialist order of society. The guy who was the number two uh, standing against Mick Lynch, Steve Headley, their former assistant general secretary, has said exactly the same. They want to overthrow capitalism and create a socialist form of society. And their current assistant uh, general secretary, Eddie Dempsey, has said that they are trying to create a culture of civil disobedience. That's revolution, right? Civil disobedience in the country. On top of the fact that they've been off to Ukraine and <laughs> expressed their support for the pro-Putin mob out there, who we now see are rapists and murderers. Uh, and so it goes on. As you look through the leadership, this is the consistent uh, pattern that they have. Um, and the far left's uh, big triumph has been to trumpet the fact that they want socialism 
without actually being in any way specific about what they mean. But if you dig deeper, a really disturbing picture emerges. Now, the the manifesto of the Communist Party of Britain, right, the party that mm. their RMT president is on the executive leadership of, right, leadership, um, you read their manifesto, it's extraordinary. They want mass nationalisation without compensation. That means the utilities, railways, bus, road haulage, construction, engineering, banks. But it's right down to the aviation industry, estate and advertising mm. agencies, luxury hotels, even second homes without compensation. They want the purges of the... I'm quoting directly from their material here. It sounds so extreme you wouldn't believe it. Purges of the leadership of the police, the courts, diplomatic service and the army and their their replacement by people sympathetic to the revolution and then mm. and then uh, the political education of the lower ranks to be um to be taken on by trade unionists uh, and mm. then um, the abolition of the monarchy but the replacement the replacement of the police by a people's militia <laughs> trained by trade unionists that's armed trade unionists i mean this is fantasy politics but they're very, very serious about it. These are the descendants of the people who tried to take over the Labour Party from Neil Kinnock. They're the people who backed Jeremy Corbyn, who did, with, together with his associates, he did want a communist revolution. And I think when people say, as they do often interviewing RMT leaders, are you a Marxist? It's not sufficient to stop there. You have to ask, what does that mean? And if they've got these ulterior long-term motives, you've mm. got to question quite what they really are after. And they've made it clear in their own quotes. It's very clear that some of these people at the top of these organisations are committed Marxists, communists, very extreme people. Uh, but I suppose when it comes to the ordinary members of these organisations, the people who are actually withdrawing their labour over these weeks and indeed perhaps months, uh, they aren't the same sort of militant uh, left-wing agitators that the leadership is. Uh, I suppose when it comes to what people in the country think of these organisations, they're not going to look so much at the executive of the RMT and how many uh, members of the Communist Party. They're going to look at the, the sort of uh, normal members who are withdrawing their labour. Should we be looking more at the leadership? Should we be applying more scrutiny to the politics of this? Um, of, of course, as, you're, as from what I said, with all these extreme, crazy ideas that they subscribe to, yes, I absolutely think we should. I mean, they the, the leadership of some of these unions are working straight out of the Marxist playbook. By playbook, I mean what Marx and Lenin have said. They believed firmly that it was the duty of the educated revolutionary elite to activate the workers, to educate the workers in order to be able to use the workers for the revolution. But they saw a clear mm. distinction between them as the them as the educated revolutionaries who understood mm. their theory um, as opposed to the ordinary members. Uh, mm. they, they want to be able to mobilise, uh, they want to be able to create, um, uh, they want to be able to create a, a sense of anger and mm. conflict. Uh, you know, I mean, Marx... But, but how, how far, how far in, can we take this, though, Giles Udi? Because I, I suppose members of the Communist Party may want an ideal society that has uh, these perhaps armed militias of trade unionists patrolling the streets and all the rest of it. But they're never going to win an election. They know that they uh, aren't going to sort of reach that point. How much of this should we be taking seriously? And how much of it is just sort of flights of fancy of these people? Well... We should take seriously the fact that they are a very vocal and powerful minority. In the last election, where the hard left did not vote for, uh, for didn't vote for Corbyn as they did later on, they scored one third of the the the, the votes of the monster raving loony party. <laughs> I mean, seriously, these are a tiny minority in the country. Now, the, the actual claims of their members for better conditions are in some cases fair and certainly need to be considered. But they're, they're, the country needs to separate the, the rhetoric. They need to separate the, the long-term goals from the immediate issues. It's not 
unfair to say that the immediate issues facing the country at the moment are very serious. But look, these people want to destroy Christmas people's Christmas break. I mean, just to finish off with one other quote, uh, one of their, their former leaders who I've already spoken about, in a past RMT strike, he tweeted that it had taken, it's taken me three hours to drive eight miles, mission accomplished, gridlock achieved, victory to the RMT. They want to wreck people's holidays because they want to create civil disobedience. They've mm. said this. And of course, people are going to be fed up. Of course, people are going to blame the government. The government may have some responsibility, but they want to stir up unrest, mm. disunity in the country. It's fascinating to see that real underlying politics of all of this, not just about pay, not just about conditions, but about making the country angrier, about making the country uh, sort of fighting amongst themselves, sowing division and, and, and perhaps trying to remove a government that way. There, there, there certainly does need to be a, a lot more scrutiny on the leaders of these trade unions, particularly as some of them are talking about now coordinated strike action, moving towards what may be described in some terms as a general strike. Just very finally, uh, what's the risk of a general strike? Well, they have this fantasy. They have been looking back ever since 1926 to what they call the Great Strike when the, the, the country did go on strike. In fact, it didn't last more than a few days and it collapsed. But they've had this romantic fantasy that we're going to do it again. We're going to bring the country to its knees. Everybody's going to go on strike. This is for them just saying general strike isn't just the words general strike. It's harking back to what they see as, as a great triumph for the, mm. for the hard left. But, uh, you know, it flopped then. People just weren't going to take for it, take it, apart from the miners who carried on for weeks um, and had to get supported by the Kremlin, piling uh, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of pounds, millions in today's money, mm. into the miners' union to support them fighting the government. Wow. I mean, it is remarkable when it's put in those terms. I, I suppose we're not going to get anywhere close to what we saw in the 1920s. But the fact that the people at the top of these organisations are sort of fantasising about it should tell us a great deal indeed. Uh, Giles Udi, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been a fascinating conversation and something indeed we should be speaking about much more. Well, moving on now, the Adam Smith Institute, the uh, economic think tank, has released a new report today on intergenerational inequality. Entitled Boomer or and Bust, Boomer and Bust, it draws attention to the increasingly large divide in between the generations in this country. From the triple lock on pensions, boosting those pensions more than wages, and access to property being constrained for young people more so than it's been at any point in recent history, the question must be asked, is society working for younger people? And by younger people, I mean basically anyone under the age of 65. Well, Dan Pryor is head of research at the Adam Smith Institute and joins me now. And Dan, uh, first of all, what is the background to this report? Is there this, this growing sense of intergenerational unfairness? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me, Tom. So it haven't, hasn't happened on purpose or out of any sort of malice, but we did find that politics has become geared towards older people at the expense of younger generations. And the end result is that we'll all end up poorer. And as you mentioned in your intro there, the elephant in the room is not building enough houses. Home ownership amongst young people has plummeted across the country. Just to illustrate, in the 80s and 90s, would have taken the average 30-year-old first time by about three years to save enough for a mortgage deposit. And today it takes nearly 20 years. But there was some good news, uh, and we did some polling along with this research, and that people are starting to realize this when it comes to housing. Uh, our polling mm -hmm. shows overwhelming acceptance across generations that it is much harder today for young people to buy a home than it was for mm -hmm. their parents. It's the kind of wasting money on avocados and Netflix narrative is thankfully a fringe view, <laughs> it seems. Uh, and even more encouragingly, it shows majority support for more homes being built in people's local mm -hmm. areas. That's up 14 percentage points since we did a similar poll in September last year. Mm. But as you say, of course, it's not just housing. Public spending since 2010, at the very least, has been geared towards mm. older people. Pensioners have become nearly mm. 900 pounds a year better off compared to the working age population. Uh, and of course, mm. the other area we looked at was education, lockdowns having a significant impact and the long-term effects that could have on employment and earnings. But there are also structural issues that we have mm. with post-secondary education in particular. But, but, but Dan Pryor, when people talk about the word 
inequality. Uh, there is a worry here that in order to uh, really fix inequalities, what needs to be done is take things away from some people to give to other people. I, I, I hope your report isn't advocating taking money away from older people to give to younger people. Is there, is there a better way that uh, a, a, a more level society is there, to coin a phrase perhaps, a levelling up rather than levelling down that could be achieved? Yeah, so I think you're absolutely right that there are win-win solutions when it comes to this intergenerational issue as well. But I'd also just push back a little bit on what you said there in that if the intergenerational inequality is actually a result of the state already redistributing wealth towards a certain group and it's, it's already done that, then reversing that distribution that's already taken place is not any sort of uh, kind of socialist plot or anything like that. Um, but onto the kind of specifics that we looked at on housing, one of the key things we asked for is to abolish stamp duty. It's an incredibly damaging tax that penalizes people for improving their property or moving to somewhere that suits their circumstances better, destroys wealth, and it stops young people getting on the housing ladder. And I think more broadly, the government has to reverse course on its its recent decisions around planning. The drama over watering down housing targets has been a real kick in the teeth for millions of young Brits who can't afford to get on the housing ladder or are paying hand over fist to rent. Uh, on tax and spend, and this is kind of, I would say the most controversial element, is we suggested reviewing the triple lock on the state pension. Um, the level of the state pension, I think, is a separate issue from how it should change year on year. But the question we were asking is, why is it that pensioners should be getting large pay rises when wages are stagnating for working age people and have been for decades? I think we should all have a stake in the UK's economic success. And there are fairer and I think more sustainable approaches mm. that continue to protect pensioners against inflation shocks like we're experiencing at the moment uh, and ensure they also benefit from rising wages, but yeah. manage to, to kind of address this balance. A lot of people are very worried when we talk about things like the triple lock on pensions, because removing that triple lock means that pensioners might feel very, very exposed. And there are a lot of pensioners in this country who do only rely on the state pension, who are uh, uh, quite uh, struggling when it comes to, 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 to the cost of living. I, I suppose on the other end of things, there are a large number of pensioners who are very well off as well. I suppose a, a sensible policy would be look at these different groups in different ways. Don't give lots of taxpayers money to millionaires and perhaps focus it on those who are generally struggling. Uh, yep, you're speaking my language now. That's what we looked at in the report as well, is trying to make sure that pension spending and state pension spending is, is geared as much as possible towards those pensioners who are on lower incomes. I think we can learn a lot from Australia's approach here. Um, but I'd also say that, that this kind of fantasy that um, pensions are... are things that people have paid into a pot, um, they haven't. Uh, national insurance is effectively an additional income tax rather than a pot that people have paid into for later life. And as I said, I think the actual level the pension should be set at is a completely separate issue. But it's about how we upgrade it, how we change it year on year, and whether or not uh, that ends up having a ratchet effect where uh, pensioners end up getting more wealthy, uh, whereas young people, uh, young age, working age people, don't tend to get any sort of wage increase. Yes, I think David Lloyd George has a lot to answer for, for creating national insurance, setting it up as this sort of Ponzi scheme that doesn't actually save money for the next generation. It spends it all at the time it's raised. Really, really interesting stuff there. Let's hope that some of those suggestions, particularly the win-win suggestions, can be looked at very, very seriously indeed. Dan Pryor, thanks for joining us here on the briefing. Just finally today, Rishi Sunak has held talks in Northern Ireland, or indeed is holding talks in Northern Ireland, with political leaders at Stormont. It's his first visit to the part of the United Kingdom as Prime Minister. Now, let's get some more on this now. Our Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beatty is in Belfast. Uh, Doogie, what do we know about the Prime Minister's trip so far? Here late last night, he had uh chose not to go to Stormont. He actually had that meeting in a hotel up the road. He met all the leaders there of the executive and he had a look and, and tried to find out where exactly they all stood. Now, this came ahead or after a meeting with Chris Heaton-Harris, the Secretary of State yesterday, who tried to get 
to find some common ground with these leaders to try and get the executive in Northern Ireland back up and running. It collapsed just over a year ago because of the protocol, that deal, that Brexit deal that keeps Northern Ireland inside the EU and away from the UK. Unionists don't like it uh, and business uh, manufacturing in pretty much in the round doesn't like it either. So. Uh, just a while or two ago, the shipyard behind me here, Harlan and Wolf, the yard that built the Titanic and those white star line uh, great ships back in the last century, he, uh, tried, he announced here that there was going to be three naval ships assembled here uh, if that contract goes through by 2023, creating about 1,200 jobs in and around the supply chain of Brit British shipyards. Mm. Now, that could be a problem for Northern Ireland because of the protocol, because that brings mm. in things like taxation. British Steel has 25% tariffs put on it. Are the ships going to be built here, assembled here? Nobody quite knows what, where that stands. And of course, mm. then it brings in all sorts of issues around um, mm. uh, funding, state aid, for uh, British companies. Do you, do we do, we do only have about 20 seconds, but I do want to ask you this very last question. The Prime Minister's in Northern Ireland today. The Foreign Secretary this week has been meeting with his EU counterpart, Maros Sekovic, in Brussels. Could there be some behind the scenes movement on the protocol going on? There is definitely movement, and I, I would imagine by the 19th of January that Chris Heaton Harris will probably call an election for early March because the Americans are very keen to have the Northern Ireland executive up and running for that upcoming mm. 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, and Joe mm. Biden has been pushing for that. Uh, whether there's much to uh, sort of appease the unionists mm. and bring them back to the table, we'll wait and see. Really, really fascinating stuff there. Something to keep our beady little eyes on and make sure that uh, any, any difference uh, in that protocol is, is uh, beneficial to people of the United Kingdom. Doogie Beatty, thank you so much for joining us here on The Briefing. Uh, I'm afraid that's it for the show today. Thanks for joining me. I'll be back on Monday at 9.30. But for now, uh, stick with us because it's Esther and Phil to come up next.